Hi, everyone, and thank you, first and foremost, to my panel, but hi, everyone, also in the audience and everyone who's watching at home or in their office. Now, welcome to our panel on energy security and the European Green Deal. Of course, the war in Ukraine has highlighted really the vulnerability of European Union energy supplies and underlying the importance of the energy transition to Europe's energy security. Now, before the war, I know everybody knows this, but it's always a good reminder, Russia was responsible for around 40% of the EU's gas imports, a figure that the bloc now wants to bring down to zero this decade. And while Europe is burning more coal and seeking energy from alternative sources that could temporarily raise emissions, it wants to accelerate the transition in the longer term. Now, a number of CEOs have also called for a strengthening of the key pillars of the Green Deal by increasing ambitions in areas like the European carbon market, albeit with more support for domestic industries. They're also seeking to increase the specialized workforce needed for the transition to cleaner energy. So I could not be more delighted to have this all-star panel with me. Pedro Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain. Gitanas Nauzeda, President of the Republic of Lithuania. Anna Borg, President and Chief Executive Officer of Vattenfall. Franz Timmermans, European Commission Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal. And Esther Bajet, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Novozyme. So thank you all for joining us. I know we have one hour and we have very, very big topics to discuss. So without further ado, Prime Minister, let me start off with you. How can the EU at the same time deal with the short-term challenge of ensuring energy security with this urgent need to scale up the green transition? Well, uh, happy to be here. I think that uh, the European Union uh, is facing three, three major challenges in, uh, in the energy field. The first one is an unprecedented spike in gas, uh, electricity and fuel prices. Second, uh, the need, as you said, to urgently uh, phase out gas, oil, and uh, coal imports uh, from Russia uh, and build uh, our energy independence and uh, security of supply. And finally, to deliver on the climate goals. Uh, and I think that we need uh, four, four things in the European Union. The first one is, and, and I would say the foremost, uh, we must quickly increase the share of renewables and electrification. Second, we need to accelerate joint uh, gas purchase. This is something that we've been very vocal uh, in, in the European Council. And also to uh, diversify our suppliers via higher LNG imports and pipelines from non-Russian uh, suppliers. Third, we need to bolster the use uh, of uh, biogas, biomethane, and of course renewable hydrogen. And finally, thinking long term, I believe uh, we need uh, to uh, uh, alterate, to uh, actualize, to modernize uh, the rules of the European electricity market. So I think that this war and uh, the big lessons that we have to take from this war is that renewable energies is not only um, a fundamental question to face the climate goal, but it's the best allies for the European Union uh, for its independency and its uh, 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 strategic autonomy. Thank you so much. President Alzeda, you've, you've taken actually some pretty impressive measures to you know, be energy independent, to cut away from Russian dependency. Can you talk us through some of those efforts? We started it very early because our long history experience to deal with Russia was the uh, experience of manipulations, blackmailing, and this was the reason why we started to implement the first very important projects in 1999, 23 uh, years before the war in Ukraine broke out. I have in mind uh, the oil terminal in, uh, on, on the coast, on the Baltic Sea, and then the game changer uh, in our independence story was LNG terminal in Klaipeda, built in 2014. But uh, those are only partial measures to increase our security. We uh, developed also uh, the infrastructure of pipelines. First of all, uh, the pipeline to uh, the Bo uh, Poland, uh, gas interconnection Poland-Lithuania which could satisfy the needs not only Lithuania and Poland, but also other Baltic countries and even Finland. We have Baltic Link uh, 
which allows us to import electricity from Sweden. And we have Litpol link, which allows us to do the same with Poland. So you have very broad range of infrastructure projects, which allowed us recently, beginning of April, to say enough is enough. We are ready to refuse to buy any energy resources from Russia, oil, gas, and recently even electricity. We are ready to do this. First of all, because we would like to be independent, but we also feel the moral duty not to pay for these atrocities, even indirectly, but still for those atrocities in Ukraine. Because from our money or using our money, Russia is paying the, uh, financing the war. So I think Lithuania is a very good example of strong political will, consistency, no matter what the government was in office, there was certain cons consistency to reduce our dependence on Russian energy resources. And now we are in the final stage, and of course one more important project we envisage to implement and until 2025 is energy uh, electricity synchronization projects, which allows us to connect our electricity grid to the continental Europe and disconnect from the former Soviet Union Brel system. So it will be the final stage of our long way. And I think this is a very good example to our colleagues in Europe. Just you can do the same. Yes, you need the time. But you know, this was probably because we didn't have any illusions regarding right. Russia. So having very long, centuries long experience to deal with Russia, we didn't have the illusions. Sometimes illusions are good. You can feel happier, you would like to see reality brighter than it is, but we didn't have this. No. And it allowed us to implement those decisions which are critically needed for Lithuanian people and for our moral obligations and moral contribution to the uh, Ukrainians' fight for the freedom. I mean, it's about resolve, but it's also having that timeline, right? And you had much more time than other countries now have. And let me come to you because, of course, Vattenfall is a leader in renewable energy in Europe. Your objective, which is extremely ambitious, is to deliver a fossil-free economy in one generation. How would you achieve that? Well, we are actually well on the way, and I think that we have to achieve that if we're going to be competitive in the future. Because to me, this transition is not only about mitigating climate change, which is, of course, immensely important. And now we have the geopolitical perspective on top of that. But I also think it's a matter of competitiveness for companies in the future. So when we phrase our strategy like that, it's clearly our business strategy. It's not our sustainability strategy, but it is a sustainable business strategy. So we have started that journey, uh, and as you said, we are one of the leading uh, renewable energy builders and operators, mainly in offshore wind in Europe. But I think in order to succeed going forward, and especially with this more squeezed timeline that we now see, it's important to not exclude any fossil-free energy sources. We're going to need everything we can get our hands on. And that goes for wind power, solar power, nuclear, and any other kind of innovative solutions that can be, uh, that can be helpful here. Um, and I think that what we need to do now is to focus on what we can do with the technology that it's already there, the capabilities are there, and the financial markets are there. Now we need to widen the bottlenecks in order to get these projects up and running much faster than what was the case before. And I'm very glad and welcome the initiative last week also from, uh, from EU on actually shortening the permitting processes for building new uh, wind power or solar power, but also needs to include infrastructure. Because there is a sort of possibility to do this, but we really need to release the forces that can make it short term. Mr. Timmermans, I guess the, the main question right now is first, will we get an oil embargo from Europe and what happens if there's a gas embargo from Russia, like how will we deal with that? Well, first of all, we'll deal with it. We'll be able to deal with it. It will be hard, difficult, but we have enough solidarity in Europe to deal with it. Uh, you saw when uh, Poland was cut off, Germany immediately jumped in. When Bulgaria was cut off, Greece immediately jumped in. And that's how we will react. 
Uh, there is no way Putin can blackmail us with his gas. And if he cuts us off, he's going to hurt himself more than anybody else. Uh, we have our reserves. We are now going around uh, buying LNG and pipeline gas from other uh, producers. Um, at the same time, we offer these producers a long-term relationship, not just based on fossil fuel, but also based on the green hydrogen economy of the future. And most of these countries are very interested to be part of that. You, I believe you will see the Mediterranean will become, the Mediterranean basis will become the center of the world's new energy supply, which will be green hydrogen. And Europe will be part of that. Africa will be part of that. Uh, the Gulf will be part of that. And that, uh, that's extremely exciting because it will deliver a sustainable source of energy that is almost limitless uh, because of the, um, the um, uh, way we can uh, create electricity through solar panels and offshore wind. Uh, so I think that's the future. In of what course, kind of time frame? Sorry? In what kind of time frame? Well, I think, I think we, will be, we can free ourselves of Russian fossil fuels between now and 2027 at the latest. Uh, in that time, we will have to do a couple of things. First of all, we have to convince companies, industry, and citizens in Europe to save more energy because the cheapest energy is the energy you don't use. And what seems like a small step for an individual becomes a huge leap if 440 million individuals take that step. So we can still save a lot of energy. That will already mean less money in Putin's pockets. Secondly, we can speed up our transition to a renewable energy. And one of the elements, indeed, is uh, uh, speeding up permitting. We want to create uh, two-go zones, uh, go-to zones, sorry, where you would do permitting once for a whole area, and then the individual projects do, would not have to be permitted uh, uh, one after the other. That would speed up, hopefully, from now seven to eight years to one year in terms of permitting. That makes a huge difference in uh, renewable energy generation. And, of course, rooftop solar. If we um, fulfill our ambitions in rooftop solar in the whole of Europe, 25% of all the electricity we need in Europe will be coming from rooftop solar. That's an incredible uh, amount. And, and then, as I said, the third part is, for now, we will need fossil fuels. We need to go and buy fossil fuels um, in the Gulf, in Australia, in the United States, and elsewhere. But we need to do it collectively. So what we're asking as European Commission is from our member states to allow us to negotiate these deals on behalf of the EU. It's voluntary, but still, I think it will be better if we negotiate it on behalf of the whole EU instead of individual countries going to Qatar and driving up the price because they're negotiating different deals. So that's, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do. Yeah, and we'll ask the Prime Minister about that. Esther, talk to us a little bit about what this means for your company. So what does the transition mean for Novozymes? It is not only for Novo Science. We are an enabler of uh, part of the solution that uh, all the items that we have put, put on the table. The good news is that the technology is ready. The science is here. The technology is scalable. The solutions to not completely eliminate fossil-based fuels. I think fossil-based fuels are going to be part of the future, but in a smaller component. If one word is very strong here in this COP, it's the word of resilience the world of ductility, the world of agility, having a broader toolbox. I think we live in a pivotal moment, uh, and the crisis of the ter tragic war on Ukraine has magnified the dependence we have on fossil fuels. And we live in a very unique moment that we can use as an inflection to move a little bit faster to the, for to the future. There is technology available to make gas from biomass. There is technology available to make bioethanol that can be replacing a, a gasoline. But that, by the way, it also feedstocks for animal. For every ton of bioethanol, you make a ton of very high value protein uh, to use and to fulfill another big need that we have of how are we feeding the world. There is technology available of carbon capture that we can give a second life to that, uh, to, the, to that precious carbons. So all options available. The question is, you made it, how fast? And how yeah. are we moving faster? And here I'm putting a little bit of a, I mean, I don't have all the answers, but maybe options that we could have. We could stop subsidizing the past. Today, 70% of the incentives that they are putting uh, in the, for the industry of energy, they go to fossil-based alternatives. Only 20% they go to renewable energy. We're subsidizing the problem. Let's use that precious cash to move fast forward, to make that transition a little bit better. Let's bring, uh, uh, you mentioned regulation. 
We need, we need to work more, better, stronger, more collaboratively, and I embrace our responsibility also to show how good could like on bringing the regulation that accelerates the change, that brings the solutions that they are ready, more agile, and that they can be plug and play into the systems that we already have. It is the, the gap is big, the gap is huge, the options are available. We have to collectively, governments, companies, uh, regulator agencies, find the path on how we can move a little bit faster in many little incremental steps. And I want to ask the Prime Minister about LNG in a second, but actually, Mr. Timmermans, I guess when you look at the green transition, will it be halted as we use more fossil fuel to deal with the dependency with Russia? And then does that transition get accelerated or does it get slowed down? Well, I think um, countries will make different choices. So the idea that was before the war predominant, that we would use natural gas as a transitional energy carrier moving away from coal to renewables. Now that you don't want to import that from Russia, you have to change your plans, which means that in some cases, some countries might stick a bit longer to coal. But if you then can speed up uh, the introduction of renewables exponentially, then in terms of emissions, you might st still come out better. And of course, I'd love to, to exit out of coal faster and not do this, but the modeling we need to do is based on that. Okay, you use coal a bit longer, but if we go faster on renewables, then in terms of our emissions, we could still be on the positive, on the positive side. Um, my biggest worry, frankly, today is not the science, it's not the technology, it's not even the finances, it's the risk of social disruption. The idea in large parts of our society is that people feel left behind or not involved, people are dying because of these enormously high energy prices, and I think that's the issue we need to address. The Green Deal will succeed if we have support of the whole of society, but the whole of society will not support us if people feel left behind. I think that's a much, much more urgent issue than many people believe who think in terms of the transition, in terms of science. And Prime Minister, I know this is something that it's close to what you're trying to do. I'll ask you about LNG in a second, but it's making sure that, I guess, the families that struggle the most and have the higher cost of living will not suffer too much in this transition. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, I, th I believe that um, security of supply is a collective task. And uh, as Franz uh, just said, I, I believe that Southern Europe uh, can provide uh, alternatives uh, to this uh, uh, huge crisis uh, caused by, uh, by Putin's war. Um, not only uh, with uh, uh, our energy mix, uh, which in the case of Spain, 57% of our uh, uh, installed capacity comes from renewable, but also since we have uh, uh, 30%, over 30%, 34% 34 of uh, the total regasification capacity in Europe is located in Spain. 50% of the LNG uh, storage capacity of the whole Europe is located in the Iberian Peninsula, which is the problem that we are facing. Well, a physical uh, uh, bottleneck uh, a problem, which is, uh, of course, the, the lack of interconnections. And that is why I think it's important what the Commission has released last week uh, with the Repower European Union uh, that puts uh, specific commitments in order to uh, develop these interconnections between the Iberian Peninsula and our European Union neighbors. And uh, just last uh, comment on this, I think it's important that these interconnections uh, make compatible not only the gas pipeline, but also the green hydrogen uh, interconnections, because that's, uh, that's our, our bet, this is our commitment, our political goal, uh, goal for, for renewable and the green transition. But what's the hardest in that? It's easier said than done. Is it financing? No, I don't, I don't think. I think it's a, it's a question of, you know, I would say lack of political will. Uh, as uh, President of Lithuania said, I think it's important that nowadays we, we open our eyes, we see that we have alternatives, Let's, let's do it and let's go for these interconnections because at the end of the day, the Southern Europe could provide alternatives to this uh, terrible mess that Putin has caused. But President Nazareth, if a war were the doorstep of Europe does not focus the mind of politicians and does, if it does not bring up this political will, then what will? Uh, sorry, it's not 
so easy to, to, to understand. So the, the, the question is, we're talking about political will to make these changes. Do you see the political will within Europe to, to make a substantial change? I, I see, and I see that uh, Green Deal agenda is the highest priority in many countries, and in my country too. And this was only the part of the job we did so far, uh, diversification of energy routes. But another, even probably more important part of our job, if we are looking long term, is Green Deal agenda. Yeah. And we are dedicated to do our best in order to achieve very significant, significant progress until 2030. And uh, let me express it in some figures. For example, right now we import about 70% of our electricity we need. 70%, this is a lot. And even with this diversification of, of, of uh, the energy, electricity supply, of course, this is not sustainable to pay so much money on the import. And until 2030, we uh, have the objective to achieve self-sufficiency in this regard. And of course, the main pillars are onshore wind. Offshore wind, we also envisage to implement very important, important projects in the Baltic Sea uh, to offshore wind uh, facilities, uh, together, taken together 1.4 uh, gigawatt. And uh, it will be possible to participate in the tenders already next year. So the companies, I really use the opportunity to invite the companies to participate in this project and also solar energy. Lithuania is the producer of very good solar, uh, solar panels, and uh, we uh, already export these panels to other countries. And uh, taken together, we envisage to increase the capacity of renewables from one gigawatt right now unto, up to seven gigawatt until 2030. And you know, the first trigger of Green Deal in Lithuania, by the way, was closure of Ignalina nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. Because according to the, uh, our agreement with European Union, just uh, it was possible to, to, to finalize our negotiations uh, regarding the membership in European Union only with the precondition that Lithuania uh, closes the Ignalina nuclear power plant, old type of Chernobyl type reactors in 2010. And we did it. And the rumors and the fears were huge that electricity prices will uh, become double as expensive as before. But at the same time, it was huge motivator, yeah. trigger to start to look for alternatives. And it was the first stage of renewables revolution in my country. Of course, taken together with uh, a very favorable price setting policy, uh, of our government, but still, sometimes the bad things provoke yeah. good uh, shifts, good, uh, good uh, processes, and now we have just to continue the, the work we started one decade ago. President, from now, what is the hardest thing to achieve, so given your goals? The uh, hardest thing to achieve probably is stable generation because we, every, everybody knows that uh, renewables is not the source of stable generation. Probably we need some basic generation in order pro to provide the stability uh, uh, to our energy system. But having in mind uh, these alternative uh, possibilities to import the electricity from our neighbors I think this is the work we can, we can do successfully. And we would be, we would, we really uh, uh, would like to be in the first lines. We would like to be the front runners in this process of switching to, uh, to green energy. And uh, me, myself, I personally uh, initiated the green uh, Lithuania initiative, and Mr. Timmermans was a part of this event, the first festival or first conference that uh, took place uh, one year ago, and we tried to gather municipalities, right. business uh, community, NGOs, 
and to ordinary people no. just to share the ideas, to share the views, and to do this good work for Lithuania, to preserve green, beautiful Lithuania for uh, next generations. Um, Anna, and this also goes to public-private partnerships, I guess. What can private companies role in this be? Well, I actually think that my main concern is the speed uh, of the development right now. And the reason I'm concerned is that the demand is clearly there. Right now, my feeling is that the business community is moving faster than politics, which is probably a good thing, because that means that we can join forces. But I think that's also because a lot of the companies have realized that the risk of not changing and not transforming into a sustainable value chain and business model uh, is much higher than the risk of remaining uh, with uh, as is. And I will give you three examples because I think that this development is not happening in the same kind of value chain as we are used to see in the energy industry. And the first example is uh, the fact that we joined forces with SSAB, a steelmaking company, and LKAB, which is a mining company, in order to produce fossil-free steel using uh, green hydrogen rather than coal in the process. And this has actually been very successful. The qualities of the steel is exactly as good as traditional steel, and the first off-taker of it is Volvo. The demand is skyrocketing, so there could have been, you know, a sale of much more of this fossil-free steel right now if it was already on the market. But the reason we were able to develop it was that we looked at this value chain end-to-end, -end. not exactly what is your piece or your piece and what has it looked like in the past, but how can we solve the problem and create a new business model. The second example is regarding sustainable aviation fuel which is a project we're doing together with Shell, Landsatec and Scandinavian Airlines, using captured carbon from a biomass-fired power plant, combining that with green hydrogen and producing electrofuels. And the third example is something that we did just this week, actually, is where we start a project where we'll build the world's first hydrogen-producing uh, windmill, where it's integrated from the beginning. So not only speeding up the development of offshore wind electricity production, but also actually producing green hydrogen directly in the wind farms and piping that ashore. And here we see a huge demand from different kind of companies and industries that would like to integrate this from the start. So I think that yes, the challenges are there, but so are also many of the solutions. And there is nowhere else to look than at ourselves to solve this because we are where we are, and we are the ones here now that need to make this work. What can private companies, Mr. Timmermans, do, do to Sorry? help? Sorry? No, I was going to ask Mr. Timmermans, what can private companies, to Anna's point, do well, to help? The, the advantage is that, that they do long-term projections, and the disadvantage of politics, because uh, support is not so stable as it used to be in politics, is that po politics has become extremely short-term. And so if we combine the long-term planning of private industry with the need to also address short-term issues of our citizens, then we will be successful. And I don't want to be you know, uh, rude to anyone, but the fact that energy companies are now pocketing windfall uh, um, profits, incredibly high profits, where citizens are suffering because they don't know how to pay, pay their energy bills, and uh, some companies behave as though this were just a fact of nature, is not helping to create a, a long-term cooperation between companies and politics. You know, you have to understand that if you want the population to support what we're doing, you also have to address their immediate needs. And the immediate needs of most Europeans today is what are you going to do about these energy and food prices that I can no longer afford? And there, you know, companies cannot shy away from that responsibility either. It's our responsibility to take care of how we organize it, but it's also the responsibility of companies, and I would especially address energy companies, to understand that they are not helping if they don't address the issue of excessive uh, profits. Yeah. Just, just a question to our, uh, my, my dear friend Franz, uh, as Commissioner uh, for Energy. Don't you think it is uh, the time to uh, also um, have a new electric, uh, uh, electricity market regulation? Yes, we need, we need to look at the design of the electricity market because it is, the more we introduce renewable uh, energy into that market, uh, the less the present system will create the, um, the right price for the customer. Um, 
But that's not something you can do overnight. That's something we need to look at very carefully because it took us 30 years to build this European electricity market, so we have to be careful not to damage it uh, by taking uh, sudden decisions. So we have to step by step uh, redesign, adapt the design of the electricity market. I agree with the Prime Minister uh, on that. Um, it's a particular challenge for countries like Spain uh, where the um, the part of renewable is already so big and then the price is dictated by a relatively small part with very high natural gas prices. I really understand that predicament, but we have to make sure in making these adaptations that we don't throw away the baby with the bathwater, but we need to adapt it step by step. But step by step is what, five months? Because again, the problem is timeline. You can have the best intentions in the world, but if you don't adapt to an ever-changing world, then we're left behind. Sure, sure, absolutely. But we also have to, 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 to um, get the best possible technical advice on how to adapt that. We have an agency that looks into that. That agency has given us some advice on how to, to start changing it. The Commission is putting some proposals on the table for the leaders to consider at the ne next European Council. We are proposing, for instance, in emergency situations to put a cap on the price if, if otherwise the whole market would be disrupted. So we are making these changes, but we have to be very careful, I insist. This construction was built over 30 years, and we need to make sure it continues to work because at the end it will deliver the cheapest possible energy to our citizens, which is renewable energy. Esther? Um, uh, we have to look at this big gap that we're facing uh, with, the, with the eyes of the toolbox of options that they're going to close it. And, uh, and then uh, we all have to seek on the way, each of us, on how we're going to make it. If each of us find the, seek for the reasons of why the, we could not make it, we also have shareholders that have very short-term uh, interest in mind. Yeah. But then we seek for the shareholders that have long-term interest of mind. I think we have to put the narrative that we bring the population understandable that there is no jobs in a dead planet. There is no future in a dead planet. There is no, no options in a world that goes in, a, in, a, in the wrong direction, that we have to create those options. And then, yes, work collaboratively. We have the responsibility to bring those solutions and to be cost competitive. We need help from the regulation. We really need help on the yep. acceleration that, that accelerates the future. And then we need to also seek from the full, you mentioned that a little bit, Franz, it's, energy is very important, but it's also food. Yep. That's a big crisis. Uh, that it's on the table, where again, there are solutions available. But we have to look for up the answers beyond the answers of the past. The same way that for energy, the answers are not anymore, only fossil-based, we're looking at other options, is the same with food. There is a need of increasing uh, the protein demand for fulfill the, the nutritional needs of the population. Well, that is the option of alternative proteins that brings, fulfills the nutritional needs, but leading to much lower impact on the landfill. Only if 10% of the protein demand would be from alternative proteins, that would relieve 50% of the European land that is used for agricultural. That will fix, alleviate a lot of the tension that we're facing here. But here again, options are there, technology works, but we need to create that value chain approach where regulation also needs to be in the loop on how we're moving faster, bolder into the future. I'm just saying, I agree with you 100%. And if we don't change our ways, our children will be fighting wars over water and food. Mm. It's that serious. So we are faced with a fundamental crisis, which is the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. But I also want to draw your attention to the fact that somebody who doesn't know how to make it to the end of the month yes. can't be bothered with the end of the world. They want us, us to, to face the issue of the end of the month. And that's how you bring them along in a narrative about the end of the world. And I'm just saying, as, as a politician, that that is my biggest worry today. Social disruption because people feel left behind. Can, can I ask you something? Because I spoke, actually, Mr. Timmons, to a chief executive of an Italian energy company who was saying, you know, windfall tax is a good idea. So why have some governments in Europe still not put them in place? Why are they reluctant? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I just don't get the logic of it. And you, you could do several things. You could say, okay, in these situations where you have these excessive profits, we will, we will tax that. 
but only in that situation. So if that's no longer there, we will stop immediately with that taxation. You could do that, or you could say, we will tax part of it, and the other part, uh, boys and girls, you will invest in renewables, and then we will not tax it. But now, you said 20% only. I think it's even lower than 20%. Okay, I was generous. Um, uh, so, you know, we really need to force them to put more into renewables as well. Yeah. And who's Anna them? Bar who's them? Well, especially the big oil companies. They, they're the ones, I think they're only investing 4%. Oh, yeah, no, I was talking about renewables. the subsidiaries from yeah, the government. I'm just talking about oil companies, 4%, if yeah. I'm, if yeah, I'm yeah, that's, that's correctly true, yeah. informed. Mm -hmm. that, you know, and then they said, we doubled our investment in renewables. Wow, 4%. So we still have a world to win here, and we need to push them more. <laughs> Anna? I would, I would like to add in one perspective, because I completely agree with the importance of uh, protecting the vulnerable uh, groups in society and making sure that everybody is sort of long in this journey, because otherwise it will not happen. I also think it's important when considering updated market designs to remember that the fundamental problem is uh, a demand supply problem. So we want to have more supply of fossil free um, electricity and energy in Europe. And how do we sort of foster that? Um, it might not be a market design issue only. There might be other things as well. Yeah. And when it comes to investments into new energy production, that's investments that will have to last for 25, 35 or 40 years. So the fact that the sort of prerequisites in order to invest, invest are fairly stable is also very important for this to happen. And I think that if there's going to be a taxation, I think it's important it targets the right things. As you rightly point out, there might be you know, fossil fuel components that you would like to taxate in order to speed up this transition. But it needs to be carefully done so you don't at the same time hamper the investments into yep. new renewables. Yep. And I can't speak for the oil companies, but I know that in our case, 50% of our investments go into new renewables, yep. and pretty much the rest goes into taking care of the existing renewables. Yep. So I think it's important how you tailor this. Prime Minister, can I ask about renewables? Because you have a hugely ambitious goal, actually, for Spain, from 47% of the energy used thanks to renewables in 2021, by 2030, you want 74% of electricity yes. generated by renewables. How will you achieve that? Well, by the way, Spain was one of the first countries in Europe uh, uh, that we face all this problem of the windfall profits and to intervene in the market. I don't know why uh, it is uh, for the mainstream politicians and also economists uh, really normal to intervene in the financial sector when it doesn't work, but it's so difficult to intervene in the energy sector or the market when it, it, it is clearly not functioning in Europe. I mean, we've been uh, advocating for uh, a regulatory review of the electric, uh, electricity uh, European market since 12 months yeah. before the war. Uh, we started to, to, to speak about it in the European Council, also with the Commission, and I think that we need uh, France to speed up the reform because definitely it doesn't make any sense to pay uh, or, or, or to have this uh, spike uh, gas uh, price and that is, that is at the end of the day poisoning uh, the electricity market and of course the electricity bill for SMEs, industries and families. So, and, and if we want to have uh, social support for this green transition, we need to be much more ambitious at the European level in order to face these, uh, these challenges uh, that, uh, that we are now you know, sharing. But of course, we are very committed with, with the green transition, you know, just to have to Prime give Minister, you some... why do you think it has been so slow? Well, I think it's important. I mean, it's, it's difficult to move the status quo. But at the end of the day, we are in a very defining moment. Those governments, like the governments that were present here, we're very committed with the green transition. We don't want to use the pandemic or even the war as an excuse not for going to this green transition because we know what is at stake. The thing is that, of course, as I said before, it is difficult, I don't know why, to intervene the energy market, uh, whilst the financial market, when it doesn't function, politicians and also economists, they go for the intervention. 
And it's clear that we need an intervention at the regulatory framework. Of course, we're putting a lot of money. I mean, from the next generation European Union funds, Spain will receive in the next years 70 billion euros. We are allocating 40% of those 70 billion uh, euros on, uh, in green transition. But of course, if we need to, um, uh, to keep the social support and understanding to this huge challenge, which represents the green transition and the climate change, we need also to uh, actualize and, uh, and to modernize our electricity regulatory framework at the European level. If we don't do that, we are going to uh, put in uh, risk all the green transition, and we are now witnessing the effects on the ETS market, the financial speculation that the ETS market is suffering, and of course, uh, the electricity bill for families, SMEs, and industries. It doesn't make any sense that we pay, uh, you know, gas prices when we have uh, a, a very a competitive energies such as renewable energies. I just wanted to to say and to use this opportunity to say that in order to uh, increase the resilience of uh, our our society and our economy to uh, unexpected price shocks it's very important to find modern smart solutions for energy consumers and i i don't know how uh, widespread is this experience but we use so-called remote prosumers uh, policy in lithuania it means that actually every single resident of the multi-apartment house has the right to acquire the stake of solar plant and at the same time can enjoy, for example, uh, 25 years, the electricity prices zero. There's no need to be uh, just afraid of unexpected price shocks because you are at the same time consumer but you are the, at the same time a uh, producer of uh, the electricity. And uh, we have the initiative in Lithuania uh, where the state institutions are already involved in this project and the presidential office uh, just wants to take the leadership in this, showing the way that other institutions can participate too. But this is important that also the households uh, could be ready to participate in this project too. Of course, this is an issue probably of social inequality because the people without the uh, initial capital, they cannot participate in this program and it brings even more uh, social inequality in the society. But this is a very good instrument to invite, to encourage the people to use modern technologies, modern techniques in order to be a part of the game. And one more issue I would like to touch is, of course, energy efficiency. We didn't talk about energy efficiency, but uh, this is very important too because we have untapped potential to reduce energy consumption per GDP, cap, uh, per GDP unit in my country, and this is a part of the problem. I think we have to do more and we have to continue our renovation program of our multi-apartment houses and we started very well but so far we are in the process and if we finalize this program i think our uh, energy efficiency in the country uh, will be much um, larger than it is now um, Anna Berg, I mean, to a point actually that the president made d does renewable energy need to be cheaper than fossil fuel or has the war in Ukraine actually changed that to, in terms of pricing to make it, you know, very appealing? And when, what kind of energy, you know, what kind of timeline could we see that? Who wants yeah. to answer first? It's the cheapest already now. Yes, it's, yeah. already it's already but cheapest. It's already not, cheap. I mean, not all of it, right? Because you, you have a huge capital investment to start off with. Yeah, but if you look today at building new uh, electricity production or electricity generation, then it's clearly uh, the cheapest way to do that is to, to build onshore and offshore wind and solar, uh, for sure. So, so that is clear already today. Then you need an energy system, which you have a holistic view on, because you need to have different kind of fossil-free energy sources and different kind of flexibility and storage in order to be able to manage the, uh, the total system. 
But I think it's important once again to remember that the fundamental problem here is uh, a discrepancy between demand and supply. Uh, and the knowledge, the capability and the capital to provide that additional supply is there. So the sort of regulatory framework or political decision making need to make sure that there is a widening of the bottlenecks to sort of enable all of this to actually come to market as soon as possible. And then we're talking about uh, su securing supply chains, we're talking about these permitting processes and the timing, we're talking about uh, providing land and sea to actually build on, and also take care of the sort of um, social uh, concerns around how to build these new business opportunities and let everybody take part of the upside of that. And for those where it might not be possible, actually take care of the vulnerable groups. But to facilitate this, rather than creating uncertainty about the investment prerequisites, is going to be critical. I mean, you mentioned wind, it also has to be 100% reliable. I live in the UK where there are you know, wind farms, but if there's no wind, we had to resort to coal last year. Well, I just want to pick up on, on, the, on President Nazar and his point about energy efficiency. If we double our efforts in refurbishing buildings, office buildings, official buildings, housing, we will save an additional 20 billion cubic meters of gas every year. 20 billion cubic That's huge. At the same time, we will immediately bring down people's energy bills. Because if they have solar panels and heat pumps instead of what they're doing now, their energy bill will drastically be, be lower. And even if they rent, the rent increase through this refurbishing will be l a lot less than the decrease in their energy bill. So they make money and they get a much better house at the same time. So we need to really speed up that. And we need to give the good example by beginning with office buildings, with schools, with hospitals. Spain has a massive program on that. And it really works. And if you do it for private housing, you bring, you can show people you, your house is better and your energy bill is, is lower. And at the same time, that money is no longer going into Putin's pockets. So it's win, 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 win. And that's where we need to speed up. And we can do that. And it also brings local jobs. These are jobs yeah. On the spot, this is small and medium-sized enterprises doing that. So there's only advantages, and the money is there. And, and you know, Spain is, has presented us with a recovery plan that is that is AAA, really very good. And part of that is also to put money into that. Uh, Lithuania is doing exactly the same thing, and that is bringing us really huge advantages that are bankable with our citizens as well. Agree, Esther. And building uh, on your comment on on cost. We have to be true to ourselves when we look at the real cost of one option or one alternative versus another. Yes, uh, green energy, green fossil, green alternatives to fossil base, or so gas from biomass, bioethanol, they are competitive from a cash cost point of view. They are very competitive. Then you need the capital intensity. But what is the real cost of the fossil-based alternatives? What is the cost of the CO2 emissions? What is the cost of flooding? What is the cost of uh, climate change? What is the cost that we all absorb with uh, health uh, aspects or, or insurance? Those are just hidden costs uh, that they are not absorbed by anybody. I really, uh, as a thought, uh, the, the concept of carbon pricing, putting a real cost making the hidden costs visible, it would truly uh, drive the momentum to the most cost competitive alternatives, which are the bio-based solutions, which are the green alternatives. They are the most competitive, but we have to self-help us that when we look at the costs and that we compare the economics, we really look at the full uh, P&L, not only the one of one little, one little component. Prime Minister, what will be your biggest challenge in actually moving to 74% renewables by 2030? As, as Franz uh, said, I think it's uh, the most important uh, challenge for politicians is to uh, keep on board uh, the majority of our society. And, uh, and for that, I think it's, it's important that they uh, see the profits of this green transition and uh, try to avoid uh, measures that could have a regressive impact on those who are suffering the consequences of first the pandemic, before the financial crisis, and nowadays the consequences of this terrible war. This is a very important issue, and I would like to join the Prime Minister of Spain by saying that 
this is very important to get all the groups of our society on board. And even if the prices of uh, uh, carbons will go uh, down, maybe it will happen in the future, we have to keep this motivation to go forward because this is not only about the price. This is about the future. This is about the Green Deal. This is about the climate change objectives. And uh, I think this is a main challenge, but at the same time, the main task for the politicians to involve all the groups of the society into this very important uh, project. And what do you think is the main task for, for both, I guess, private sector leaders and, and politicians? Uh, I think that uh, clarity is important, uh, and we now see a sort of alignment around the long-term and mid-term targets, and that's really good. But we also need to see enough action short-term in order to speed up uh, what we are now supposed to do. So I think that's where we need to go to work together to make sure that we can widen these bottlenecks in order to sort of release the forces that we have now. Because again, the technology, the capability and the capital is there. Uh, and now we finally have an alignment on the long-term view as well. I think it's interesting, as you said, that that these days the companies are long-term and politicians are short-term. Because usually it used to be the other way around, at least according to the sort of uh, public discussion. Mm. And, and what does that say? <laughs> and and how, do we, how do we sort of align on what needs to be done here and now in order to drive the development soon enough? Mm. Is there I think it's, it's so important that we combine long-term goals with short-term successes. Because that's how you keep people on board for this long-term journey. I think that is of the essence, and we can do that. We can do that in this refurbishing of homes. We can do that in offering more charging infrastructure for people who consider transiting to electric mobility. We can do that through cycling paths. We can do that through greening cities, uh, which, which is happening. In many, you know, just imagine in Spain, if you really green a city more than you do now, you bring the temperature down, you bring the air quality up, 400,000 Europeans die prematurely because of bad air quality every year. You can do something about this immediately. So combine this long-term goal we have with immediate, concrete, visible, tangible results for our citizens, and they will be on board. With more financing or as we are? Well, I think, I think because of this war, Sooner or later, Europe will be faced with a question of financing. We're now scraping the bottom of the barrel, you know, to, to finance Repower EU. We're doing everything we possibly can. But the budget is the budget, and we can't go beyond that. So sooner or later, there will be a moment of reckoning when our leaders in the European Council will have to ask themselves, are these, uh, is this money we have enough to face the challenges. I think the answer will have to be no once we understand how important it will be for us to help the reconstruction of Ukraine. I think that is of essential importance for Europe. But that is something our leaders will face at a certain point. A very difficult discussion, but I think this is something they will face sooner or later. Esther? I think it all boils down to collaboration, to embracing that we all win or we all lose. And, uh, and we have to do this together. Uh, there is the short term and the long term, but actually the short term, the long term, it's many, many short terms, one after the other. So it is working collaboratively, uh, setting the path on what is possible and how we're moving, and then celebrating success. The point you mentioned about the narrative to the population, that we bring help and enhancing the education, education maybe that's, enhancing the knowledge and understanding of how good looks like. Of course I worry about the short term, but it cannot be only the short term. So building that narrative collectively on how success looks like and then moving jointly through technology, through solutions, through inventive, through regulation that moves us up in one direction. We're almost running out of time, so I want one final question for each of you. And what is your priority in the next 12 months, personally, to make a difference in the green energy transition? So if, if you have one priority that you want to make sure gets done in the next 12 months, Prime Minister. Well, I think that it's uh, to give certainty, political certainty and political will, that the Spanish government is committed with the green transition. And we are not going to move uh, back, but to move forward in this, uh, in this uh, endeavor. And, uh, and of course, to uh, 
accelerate the um, execution of the European funds, which I think is crucial for not only the economic recovery, but also the modernization of the Spanish economy. President Azina. I will continue my Green Lithuania initiative, and uh, my efforts will be dedicated to get as many institutions, business entities, and people on board participating in this very important project. Anna Borg. I will focus on two things. First of all, I will continue the reshuffling of our asset portfolio and our investments into even more fossil-free electricity generation. And secondly, I will work on these integrated value chain partnerships, because that way we can not only create good business, business opportunities, but have an impact beyond our own size. Even if we are one small part of this fossil-free st steel corporation, steel producing um, industry is emitting 7% of the world's total CO2 emissions. So if we can make these value chains work, we can have an impact way beyond our size. Franz Timmermans. My top priority is to cement European unity in the face of Russian aggression. That is my top priority for the next 12 months. We need to stay united. We need to stay strong because Putin will not stop if he's not stopped uh, in Ukraine. And he's going to look for cracks in European unity. He's going to try and what he's been doing for the last 20 years, trying to divide us so that he can rule. So my top priority is European unity. To do that, the Green Deal is essential. To do that, Repower EU is essential. To do that, as moving forward faster in that direction is essential, but also in creating global partnerships for LNG and beyond that for green hydrogen. That would be my top priority for the next year. Esther Bajet. <laughs> do our fair share uh, of, the, of the transition. First, as a responsible producer, we already reduced 46% of our CO2 emissions since we started in uh, 2018, continue in that direction, embrace a scope three. We already have a scope, not only scope one and two, also scope three reduction, so walk the talk. But then uh, ensure our solutions are part of the enablers. We're not going to fix the wall, are we? But we want to be a stronger component, a stronger enable of green uh, alternatives for fossil base, uh, sustainable nutrition, be a stronger uh, enabler through biology, through enzymes, through microbes, through proteins of a better world. Well, thank you so much. Can we please give a big round of applause to my wonderful panel, Pedro Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain, Gitanas Nauzeda, Lithuania, Anna Borg, Franz Timmermans, and Esther Abaije. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.